first met you, I felt that God answered my call. There was that one place I always thought about, and I just wanted to be there with you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to everyone. Okay, so what we're going to do today, uh, before I begin, uh, just to give you an idea of uh, um, how to conduct this. I mean, those of you who are here last week, uh, you, you will understand that, uh, inshallah. Uh, we will entertain all questions, inshallah. And first, we'll just go through some of the main points, inshallah, and then we'll entertain your questions. <coughs> Let me just bring the screen up. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'ina amma ba'd. So what we're dealing with today is conflict resolution. Conflict obviously comes with, uh, because of problems in marriage, conflicts arise. <coughs> conflicts arise for different reasons. There are triggers to conflict. And um, I would say that there's probably two main situations. Uh, you could say that there's just a couple that hate one another and they just don't want to be together. But for some reason or the other, they have to be together or they feel they have to be together. So they're obviously going to be going through conflict after conflict with no end in sight because they're just in a very, very toxic relationship. Uh, there, there doesn't seem to be there any future. It's just they're staying together because of either children or culture or whatever the case is. And they've been like that for the last 10 years, then it's just an issue. I mean, what a way to live. You're going to have so much, I think it's called, uh, what is it, cortisol. Um, it, it's going to be such a stressful relationship that it's probably bad for your health anyway. But for some reason, some cultures, they say that you can't divorce until death. They're almost like Catholic cultures that you can't divorce regardless. However, in most marriages, uh, the couple love one another. They want to be together. But there's just certain issues that take place and people don't know how to manage them. So I would say that some of the main reasons for why there are conflicts is people uh, have false notions, complete misunderstanding, and absolute ignorance of the human psyche, human emotion, and the human self and state. I, I think I would probably say that that's one of the biggest issues of why there are conflicts to even start with. When a person <clears throat> doesn't understand, um, yeah, a person has no idea uh, what, uh, what men and women are like. Um, so as a man, you know, I've never been a woman, uh, never will be a woman. And so I, just by being a man, I can't understand what women are. I can understand how men are. I can't even, in fact, to be honest, I can't even understand how all men are like, because people have different personalities and emotions. I have a different set of uh, emotions and struggles and things like that than somebody else. In fact, I may get to understand people who are close to me. So my children, uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, my uncles, my friends, I get to understand their personality. Each one has a very unique set of emotions and personality traits, struggles, uh, you can say capabilities. Everybody has a separate set of, uh, of that, right? So... I'm looking at, um, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at uh, the participants. Asia Rahman, right, for example, uh, will be totally different to Amina. Now, I don't know you guys, but I'm assuming that you guys are going to be totally, have a totally different set of a very unique character, right? So if I've dealt with people with different characters, um, the more people I've dealt with, the more exper experience I should receive when I, when I do that. Uh, but again, it's still going to be limited because then I'm going to get somebody else with a totally different character. 
Now, if I'm not flexible and if, if I don't learn from the several people around me, that people can have different characters and how to react in certain cases. You know, there may be somebody with me who's very stingy. There may be somebody with me who gets angry quickly. There may be somebody with me who has a huge amount of desire, somebody who likes to argue a lot. Now, I need to learn from these different traits that different people have and then be able to identify them uh, for somebody new when I see them, right? And that will benefit to deal with the new person like that. That's number one. Number two, I think, which is probably even more fundamental than this one, uh, is that people just feel that, per that, they need, that others need to be perfect. And especially in marriage, people have this ambition and goal to find the most perfect spouse. You can't have a perfect spouse. I mean, you know, write that down on your, you know, write that down on your, as your splash screen on your phone. You know, like as soon as you log in, nobody's perfect. My spouse cannot be perfect. Really, just write that down somewhere and look at it every day. Uh, I, I can tell you that a lot of conflicts come about because people feel that my spouse needs to be perfect. Not me. My spouse needs to be perfect, right? They don't. They, they think they're already perfect. They think themselves that they're already perfect. So I don't need to be perfect. I'm already perfect, and my spouse needs to be perfect. And when she's not perfect or he's not perfect, it's an issue. Um, can you guys relate to this? Where you, we don't really concern our. Uh, we're not really concerned as much about ourselves, but we feel that our spouse needs to be perfect. Can anybody relate to that? This is a major issue. And because of that, actually, there's only one person that can relate to that. So quite a number. That means, okay, there's two now. Only two people out of 180 or so people can relate to that. That means it must not be a big issue. Oh, okay. Everybody's a bit slow this morning on Saturday. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Um, you don't have to force yourself to relate to that, but you know what I mean? That I think that's a big issue, right? That they, uh, when I deal with, so uh, when I deal with people's conflicts, this is what it is. She, 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 he, he, he. I go, tell me about yourself. So for example, recently I dealt with somebody. Um, they were just going for a divorce eventually. She didn't want to be divorced. And I said, look, for me to be able to sort this out, I'm not speaking to your husband. I'm speaking to you. Can you tell me that if I speak and when I speak to your husband, what will his complaints be about you? Okay, and she skirted around the issue for a while, uh, talking about him again. I said, look, I don't want to hear about him. He's not here. I can't, you know, there's no point in me criticizing him for you. Okay, but what I want to know is to make the matters easier so that I can deal with your case, you know, your, your, uh, you uh, sooner than later. Tell me what he would say about you. And I think finally, after really pushing and prodding, I think I got one point out of her. Then when I actually spoke to the husband, he came out with several points. Okay. Now, if you've had so many arguments, then you should know what your partner has as a problem with you. If you, uh, th this is the third big point. I want to, I, I hope somebody writes these down because <clears throat> these are actually new points that are not in the presentation. Uh, they're part of this presentation in the sense, but they're, they're, they're framed in a different way. So I, I would like you to write these down if you can. All right. So the third point is, that if you don't understand what your spouse's problems are with you, then you don't even know how to sort it out. You got, you're not even on the first square there, okay? You can't even take the first step. If you don't understand, so for that to be the case, right? Firstly, you have to, you see, until you don't realize that I've also got some issues. People do say that, yes, look, I have my own issues. I have my own issues, but, but, but he, he's got the bigger issue. Or she's got the bigger issue. That's fine. What are your issues? What are your issues? Until you can't recognize what your husband or your wife's problem is with you, then there's no way to start it off. Because then you can critically assess what the issues are and see if there's, and talk to others and just reflect for yourself. So these are three big issues. Number one, um, get out of your mind that your spouse has to be perfect because he or she can never be perfect. They're human beings. Humans can't be perfect, right? Nothing in this world is perfect. Only the Prophet ﷺ was perfect because Allah makes his prophets perfect. Nobody else. Number two, 
we have to realize that everybody comes with a separate set of traits and personalities, behavior and akhlaq, and we need to be able to understand that. And number three, well, I, I had said those the other way around in the beginning, I started off with that one, but th- those are, I think, uh, the two most important ones. And then the third one is <clears throat> that we need to start recognizing what our spouse's problems are with me, right? With, with ourselves and see how that goes on, All right? So now that's just purely from a personality perspective. Now let's look at th- some of the main issues why conflicts arise. I think one of the first ones is communication issues. Right, I touched on some of this last week in the last session, communication issues and how to try to resolve that. Number two is in-laws. They provide for a huge, I mean, uh, whether uh, purposely or inadvertently, they provide a huge uh, 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 problem uh, sometimes, even without meaning it sometimes, right? In-laws are a problem sometimes, right? And number three, money matters which can be easily fulfilled, but we just need to deal with certain behavior traits. And then the sexual fulfillment. And again, that one is a very, very complicated one because people don't like to speak about it. They find it very, 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 very difficult to speak about, right? And express themselves in this regard. And it's a really, really strange one. So let's look at these three quickly because we only have an hour. And uh, if we look at these quickly, I'm going to give you some quick points on these. I think I may have actually more in-depth uh, discuss, I mean, I have obviously more in-depth discussions about this in my book anyway, all right? But the main point here is to say <clears throat> that let's quickly deal with this so I can actually take questions from you because I think I'm mentioning these in a kind of a generic fashion. We'll give you some examples, but uh, when I have your questions, then, you know, we get a much more deeper understanding of the issues and I can try to help. Okay, so let's go to communication, uh, communication skills. I mean, just some people are very bad at communicating because they cannot uh, what's the word? They they are unable to express themselves. They can't articulate their feelings. Uh, some people just by nature speak in veiled ways, right? They speak enigmatically. They don't speak straightforward, right? Or they speak too straightforward. So the, both of these are issues. Some people skirt around the issue. They don't deal with the issue directly. They try to be too indirect, like they can be too indirect. Uh, that's one end of the spectrum, which is going to cause a conflict. It's going to cause a misunderstanding with the other person. The other one is where the person um, is too straightforward, too blunt, completely undiplomatic, uh, unkind in the way they say things. All right. Uh, very, you can say, harsh in, in their demeanor, in the way they say things, even if their heart is full of love, but they just don't know how to put that love into their voice into their expressions, into their articulation. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. There's people out there who, are, who may have love for their children or their spouse or uh, their friends or whatever, but they just don't understand how to let that love bubble out into their words as well. So, you know, you can be harsh at somebody, but there's kindness attached to the harshness, uh, to, to, to the strictness, uh, that the, it just has a totally different impact. All right? I hope you can... Um, you know, some of you may be able to relate to that if there's a certain personality, okay? So you can be strict, you can be firm, right? You can be very particularly, uh, particular and regimental, regimented, but there needs to be a love that comes along with that. For example, you know, if you want to cut through tile, ceramic or uh, the other one, porcelain tiles, that they are very hard, right? They're not like normal masonry. You need a, actually to get a special bit, a special drill bit to be able to drill through there. And it takes much longer than others, right? And also the drill bit, which is generally um, uh, has a small, small diamond uh, dust on it to help to uh, cut through. Uh, they get blunt within one or two or three cuts. They get, they get blunt as well. The other thing that you have to do is you have to use water, right? So <clears throat> water or some kind of special lubricant because it gets so hot because of the friction that it just blunts the bit, right? And can end up just causing, it just won't cut through or it's going to crack the tile or something like that if you use the wrong bit. It's the exact same thing. If your spouse has an issue and you need to bring it up, you need a very special bit, special way to say it, and you need to add the water, which is the love, the lubricant, to be able to let it go through easily, okay? Maybe... 
um, you know, saying it in a more calmer fashion or whatever the case is, a communication skills. Another big issue which I mentioned last, which I mentioned last time was if you're the one who's misunderstanding your spouse. So each spouse needs to try to be as effective as, as possible. Okay. Um, Uh, uh, what do you call it? If you, uh, sorry, um, yeah, just wait for questions at the end. Just wait for questions at the end, I guess. So, as I was saying, if you if you want to correct uh, some of the, from the person who recognizes, and each person has to recognize this, that if they're just being too harsh about it, how do they soften it down? And it's going to take a while, right? It will take a while. If you're narcissistic, it's going to be the same thing. You're going to have no empathy, all right? You're going to have no... So you have to have empathy with your... Then as long as they can see the empathy coming through, it just makes life a lot more easier. It might still be difficult. And the other person, they just need to try to understand what the partner is trying to say. So one of the ways was to mirror the person. So whenever they say something, then you actually repeat it after. Oh, so you mean I should do this? Or you mean that this is what we need to do? right? And then get a yes from them, right? If you think that, you know, your spouse doesn't, you know, communicate effectively and you're constantly misunderstanding one another, then try to just repeat after them what you think you've understood, right? And don't make that an argument. All right. The number two is the love bank. I think I discussed that last week, so I'm not going to discuss that again, but basically it's just aspects of kindness that we need to do so that anytime we have a communication issue, that love bank balance will help to, you can say, uh, overturn some of the suspicions or some of the anger that's created from there. Husnul dhan. Husnul dhan essentially means having a good opinion, trying to interpret things uh, in a positive way rather than in a negative way. There's just some people by their upbringing or by their behavior or whatever the case is, right? They uh, essentially are <coughs> uh, just look at everything negatively. They just look at the most negative interpretation, the most negative connotation that they can have from something. And these people are always going to be stressed because they interpret things in a negative fashion. Just try to have a hustle one. Don't be, don't be silly about it. Don't be totally, um, what do you call it, naive. But you have to learn that. Now, that, that to look at things positively, there's many articles online about this that you can, you can find and, and, and read. Right. That, uh, you know, just to kind of try to interpret things, be cautious, but interpret things in a positive way. And you'll see that it will have a huge impact on you. I remember when somebody said that his wife was speaking to a friend of hers who was going through marital issues. OK, and the marital issues, basically, the friend was constantly providing an update of her conflicts with her husband to this person's wife. Right. And this person then started seeing uh, a sadness and a, a change in her. OK. And essentially what's happening is that she's being affected by the other person. So if you can't deal with <clears throat> emotions, then try not to be a sounding board. <clears throat> if you if it's going to if it's going to spoil your own life, then try not be a sounding board for others as much like where you have to listen. You don't have to listen to somebody every day. Right, really, you know, you don't have to give, uh, nobody has to give an update of their daily routine, you know, or the daily conflicts to people. Mutual criticism with wisdom and tact, I think I've already dealt with that, right, where there has to be an empathy with it. Now, in-law issues, jumping to in-law issues, then, you know, so that you can ask your questions afterwards. Uh, you know, when it comes to in-law issues, you have to have clarity and expectation. So what a lot of in-laws do is that they expect the new daughter-in-law, whoever it is, to... Uh, come and conform to their ways without actually teaching them. They just expect them to know. But they, what they don't realize is that they've come from a different household where they did things differently. So, for example, uh, there was a case I dealt with where a woman got married into a family, and I don't think she had a bath, a bath tub in her house. They used to have showers or whatever the case was. But in the in-laws family, they had a bathtub and that would have to be wiped, right? Which is understandable. Okay. No, so it would have to be cleaned, which is understandable. But they also required their, their, their routine in their family was that they wouldn't just clean, uh, you know, wash it with detergents or whatever, but they would also then wipe it clean, right? And 
you know, I don't know why they would wipe it clean. Maybe it's because um, to avoid the lime scale, the water was hard or whatever the case is, but they would have to wipe it. Now, she's never wiped. <clears throat> Maybe she's from a soft water area, right, where it doesn't leave lime scales. So they never used to wipe. And in this case, but nobody ever told her that you must wipe. And they just used to find like, you know, why are you such a dirty person? Or why don't you know how to clean? Another one is, for example, that you just need to be here at a particular time. And if you're not, right, and they don't actually give you the time to cook together with the mother-in-law. This is a big issue. Expectations aren't laid for that. Let's have a discussion that, look, this is how we do things here. And they're not willing to bend as well, right? Uh, so if the if this daughter-in-law is now, you can say, pregnant, and she's fine, they will wake up in the morning, but the mother likes to start cooking at eight o'clock in the morning every day and still expects her to come and do that, even though she suffered at night, then it's still, they're just not flexible. They just don't realize. And maybe it's because the mother-in-law, you know, had to suffer these things at her mother-in-law's hands, right? So that's why she thinks it has to be the same way. So clarity and expectation is very important, right? So uh, for example, when you get married, you need to be very clear about what to expect. Go and maybe check out the house that you're going to be living in. Try to go and meet with the mother-in-law a few times to see the demeanor and the personality and so on. Ask others and so on so that you can get it. I mean, don't get a bit over obsessed about this, but at least there has to be some. Uh, husband has the most sensitive role because as I mentioned last time that he's supposed to be the head of the household, the responsible one. Anybody who's responsible has to have a lot of tax. Then in leadership position, leaders have to have many, many qualities that they have to develop, even if they don't have it personally, which means that they have to have tact, they have to have empathy, they have to have concern, they have to be flexible, they have to be able to go according to the times, they need to know when to react in a certain way and when to react in a different way. So he has a very, very sensitive role in this regard. Why does the husband have a sensitive role? Because he's the one who's the arbitrator between his mother and his wife. And that is a very, very, very difficult place to be, especially if you are of not a very strong character. If you're not a very strong character, you're going to be manipulated by your wife. You're going to be manipulated by your by your mother. All right. Or you're just going to be a mother's boy and you're going to oppress your wife or you're going to become a wife's man and, uh, you know, uh, you know, be oppressive to your mother. It's just a very, very big balancing act. If you're in that situation and everybody's in that situation, they have a mother, they have a wife. Right. Then you're going to have to play really cool, especially if you live together. You're going to have to be a sounding board. You're going to have to uh, be able to just absorb things and not uh, you know not 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 say everything you're going to have to play a part in terms of uh, maybe saying good things about one another to each other and say that you know to his wife that you know my mother while she is strict like this and she does shout and she does say these things but you know she has a lot of uh, you know she has a lot of uh, what do you call it praise for you as well she's not able to bring it up you know that there is a kind of a conflict resolution between those two that takes place as well uh, balance and fairness is the difficult part. How does he balance between his family, meaning his mother, mom and dad, and his wife's rights and responsibilities? Uh, people find it very difficult. And that's what you have to learn. You read a book on conflict resolution, read a book on balance between two individuals and so on. And uh, obviously it's a new family for, for, the, for the wife, right? Because she's given up everything. She's sad. She's come. It's a new family. So she has to make an effort to learn the ropes of that family. She's going to have to be flexible. As I mentioned last time, she's going to have to be flexible in terms of how this new family does things. For example, if she is used to cooking rice in a particular way, but the new family, the husband's family now cook in a, cooks in a different way. Don't insist on your way. Try your best to learn that way, right? Try your best to learn that way. OK, of course, the in-law should try to understand that people cook differently. So, you know, she may uh, have a different style of cooking. Uh, I mean, uh, many women, uh, unfortunately, don't even learn how to cook until they jump into the pit. It's like they basically don't learn how to cook until they, they actually start. Off they're busy until the last day and then after, uh, until the last day of their marriage, doing all other stuff, working or whatever the case is. And then after that, they literally jump in for the fight and they don't know how to fight. Right. They don't mean, I mean, I don't, I don't want to call cooking a fight, but it's basically like, like saying that without any kind of training, you're jumping into, uh, you know, it, it, you know, over the ropes into the arena. I mean, that doesn't work like that. You know, there are some basic things about cooking and cleaning. And, you know, I think I covered that uh, in our session. I think it was with Al Misbah about bringing up teenagers. Right. 
uh, uh, bringing up children. I think uh, we discussed that there, the kind of things that parents should teach their te teenagers, right? From a teenage, you know, for, uh, you know, girls have to learn certain things, boys have to learn certain things. I think boys should learn certain DIY work, right? That's what I'm trying to do with my children right now, right? To teach them some DIY. I, I want him to be there and he's actually, alhamdulillah, interested so th that he can learn that. The girls need to uh, learn how to cook. Very, very important. So, um, you, you can start off uh, with, uh, you know, teaching your daughters. And then after that, um, uh, I guess I'm going on to a different subject and then give them one day that this is your cooking day. You have to do this because it's going to cause issues. Anything that you can think of that is required in your family, you should try to prepare your children beforehand of that. So it's a new family. There's going to be a lot of new things. OK, let's move on to money problems. OK, just hold your questions. I'm sure you've got a lot of questions, but just hold on. Money problems, household income is going to be. You know, you have to remember household income is limited unless you've married this kind of billionaire who literally, you know, can just spend as he likes for the for the rest of his life. Right. That, uh, you know, and, and, and not run short of his money. Right. I mean, household income is always going to be limited. So budgeting is very, very important. OK, just because your friend's husband or whatever, you know, buy certain things for them. That doesn't mean that your husband has to do the same. OK, but, you know, a lot of conflicts arise from this. Uh, one or both spending ir irresponsibly. They're both spending irresponsibly. And then after that, when they run short of money or assets um, and uh, disposable income, and then there's conflicts based on that, it can cause a huge stress and headache. But the husband is too stingy, subhanAllah. The husband is too stingy. The husband is required to spend right on his family. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has incentivized this. The Prophet said that if you spend on your family, it's a sadaqah. If I go and go give poor people money, that's a sadaqah, right? There's a certain benefit and reward to be attained from there. There's also a reward to spend on your family. As long as you don't do israf, which means you don't go over the limit, you don't indulge them over the limit, uh, so as that you spoil their character, you sp spoil their behavior, you make them, uh, you know, uh, not value things as much because they're just getting so many things, uh, or, you know, you do it to show off. But on the opposite is also true that you can't be stingy to your family. And I've dealt with a number of cases where the women are complaining that their husbands basically are really, really stingy. There was one who was asking for an itemized bill at the end of every uh, at the end of each week, you know, for what she has spent on. Right. You know, like you get an itemized bill uh, of uh, your your phone calls or something like that. Now, I can understand in some cases, you know, if the uh, if uh, one of the spouses is a bit of a spendthrift. Right, and just spends willy nilly, you know, uh, just sees things. Like everything you desire, you just buy, it, you know. That, I can understand that there needs to be some, you know, a balance in that regard. But you have to be, uh, husbands cannot be too stingy if they're the ones, uh, you know, that are responsible uh, for uh, the, the, it forces women to want to have to go work and they don't want to do that, uh, that and, and think of many other things. I, I had a case uh, just some time ago, I think last year, which was that a person had a, <clears throat> a, a case of a person who had become a bit more health conscious and now wanted to start buying uh, organic milk, okay? Uh, organic milk and um, not the normal milk. Now, organic milk generally costs 20, 30 pence more, right? Than, than regular milk, sometimes even more than that, okay? So uh, there, there were conflicts like that, right? It was about uh, the husband being too stingy. He wouldn't change the furniture. It was a battered furniture, but he says it still works. You know, the doors are still on there of the cupboard or whatever. So uh, it, it was quite excruciating to have to listen to all of these little details about that. But eventually, this is what I said. I said, I, I asked the husband, <clears throat> I said, look, let's, let's calculate how much extra it's going to cost a year, right? For buying organic milk instead of regular milk, right? So I said, look, how, many, how much milk do you guys need every, every week or whatever? So he said this much. So I think the calculation we've done was that it was going to be about, I don't know, 30 to 50 pound extra for the year. I said, why are you arguing for 50 pounds? Just give him, just let it, let, let, let her be happy. Okay, normal milk is fine. You don't have to get organic milk. Not everybody gets organic milk, right? But to be honest, uh, to, to, be, to, to be honest, when you become more health conscious and then you suddenly start feeling bad about chicken or you suddenly start feeling bad about, you know, um, 
non-organic things, then it becomes really difficult because then you're forced to only get organic things, right? And that's an emotional state. It's a, you know, I can understand. So I said, look, just give in to that. Why, why, why do you have to, you know, be stingy about that? You know, you don't have to basically buy everything organic, but at least let her do the milk if that's what she's asking. <clears throat> so sometimes people don't look at things in the long run. They're really, really focused on the nitty gritty. And because of that, they're causing a major conflict. Um, the wife is too demanding. This generally happens when the wife has seen her friends being indulged by their husbands because maybe they got more money or whatever the case is, right? Sometimes it could be that her husband is actually just very stingy. So that, that obviously means that the husband can't be stingy. But in many cases, it's just because you're competing with one another. Hey, I, my husband bought me a new handbag or my husband's got me a new car or this new dress or whatever in weddings and things like that. It could be. So it's just you can't be too demanding because what you have to realize is that your husband has to think of the future. He has to think of maybe buying a house. He has to think of the upkeep, maybe the children's education, whatever the case is. There's a lot going on here. Right. So one has to be understanding of that. OK, money solutions. Um, the, these are just uh, some ways to avoid a conflict, provide the wife with a decent spy, stipend a month, you know, whatever that is, depending. I mean, this is over and above uh, the household uh, necessities. So the normal household groceries or whatever, you know, and the basic clothing and, and seasonal clothing that you have to buy. Give her a general stipend if she wants to give some salary, especially if she's not working then give her a stipend that she can, you know, you can just give her a credit card and say, look, as long as you trust your wife, you know, a lot of people do that is give them a credit card here. You can just spend from here or the debit card that you can just spend from here, right? Because they know that their wife isn't going to go overboard, right? So there's what, whatever way you want to do that, give her some money for herself that she can do what she likes with it, right? Have trust and don't micromanage. Consider saving up for the future, is there an absence of baraka? Is your problem that maybe you're doing everything, but there's no baraka because of certain other sins that you're doing, or you're not giving enough zakat or sadaqah, that you're withholding that, and because of that, there's no blessing in your wealth. A lot of conflicts happen because of these uh, issues that the whole, uh, the, the, the blessing is lifted. So there's darkness in the home instead, right? And that's because of sins they may be committing or because they're just not giving zakat or whatever the case is. Halal versus haram income or dealings. It could be because of that, that the, there's some haram income coming in the house and it's really taking all the uh, blessing out of it. And make sure you do continuous charity, even if a little, because I've seen that continuous charity has huge amount of benefit. It's one of the best side businesses and investments. Is side investments you can make is to just give a bit of charity extra every month, if not every week. Right. And the best way to do that is I would just suggest, please, everybody do this right after this seminar. Go ahead and set up a direct debit from your bank account of just even two pounds. If, if you don't have much money, even two pounds a week or a month or whatever the case is, five pounds, 10 pounds, 100 pounds, whatever it is that you're giving to different places, whether that be Al Misbah Academy, whether that be your local masjid, whether that be White Thread Institute. All right, just give. And I, I would say actually spread it out. That's what you should do. Spread it out, right? A few pounds here, some pounds here, some money here, and let that go every month. And you will see that that money will come back to you in, you know, in, in, in multiples. Allah says that And inshallah, that will remove much of the conflict that you have in your, you know, in money solution, money issues. There's also other ways of getting barakah in the house, like uh, reciting uh, Surah Al-Waqi'ah in the evening and so on. There's a number of other things, but sadaqa after your zakat, you know, the uh, optional charity is a huge benefit. Okay, this one. <clears throat> Problems with sexual fulfillment. Allahu Akbar. Um, one of the reasons is that needs are not being met. Now, because of that, what happens is that there's a hard feeling, there's acrimony in the heart, there's any emotional letdown, there's emotional, uh, what do you call it, dissatisfaction. And because of that, it just causes conflicts in so many other issues. See, in many cases where the husband and wife are complaining about one another, and I, all the issues that they're mentioning are superficial issues. They, they're not deep issues. They're all surface issues. So I recognize that, you know, there's something else going on here. This is not the cause for their problem. It must be something underneath. When you prod a bit more and they become a bit more comfortable, that's when they re reveal that this is the issue. Either the wife is just refusing, right? 
uh, to to indulge, you know, even though she has to, she's just refusing. Or it's the other way around, where the husband is just indulging for his own self pleasure, and there's no concern for the wife whatsoever, right? Uh, about her satisfaction, he doesn't even understand that he thinks it's all about him. This is a major issue with many, many men. They just don't understand how to. Uh, I mean, I've got a whole section on this in my book. Uh, you know, it's uh, this 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 is something. You know, it's part of our being. It's uh, part part of life. There's encouragement for this in the hadith about uh, what do you call it uh, uh, foreplay and satisfying the partner and so on. So be c- uh, able to communicate openly and honestly. I know there's a lot of embarrassment in this regard. There's a lot of higher issues. There's a lot of uh, but your husband and wife. Uh, what called, uh, what's the verse? Uh, um, أَفَضْتُمْ بَعْضُكُمْ أَوَيْزِ بَعْضُكُمْ إِلَى بَعْضٍ I forget the verse. Surah An-Nisa, right? Um, so, anyway, the, the, the thing is that you have to communicate openly and honestly. If you can't do so verbally, then do so, you know, in a letter, do so in a message or whatever the case is so that they can understand. Uh, otherwise, it's going to cause a lot of, a lot of. I mean, there's one woman contacted me just recently, uh, 50 years old. So this does not necessarily even diminish, you know, with age. She's over 50 years old, she says. And she says that the husband just doesn't give her satisfaction. She says, look, I know it's haram to look at other men, but that's what this is causing me to do. Okay, that is what this is causing me to do. So satisfaction is very important. A lot of the time, the issue is that the man is very selfish about this. Okay, well, this isn't, maybe, you know, this is not the time uh, for this to open this up in detail because we don't have the time. But this is a very, very important discussion, a very important discussion. And maybe a whole seminar on this is important. Learn the needs of one another, right? Everybody should be prepared to learn the needs of one another. I mean, one of my one of the guys that I know, uh, he has a very simple principle. He tells people, he says, "Look, the man should basically make his wife climax twice before he climaxes himself." I know that was a bit, you know, that that was a bit graphic there, but I think I have to say it this way just to make it clear that for the man to stop being selfish, maybe put in his mind that let the wife come twice before he comes the first time because. Men generally, they they uh, once they come, then they get tired. Whereas the women, they can come more than once. So, if the, if if you do that, so you're focusing a lot on the wife and making her happy and satisfied. A lot of men complain the wife doesn't want it. She doesn't, you know, she's not uh, she's not interested or whatever the case is, and um, it's constantly an issue. She's complaining about having showers and washing her hair and this that, and the other. Well, make it interesting, and if you make it interesting and you're fulfilling, then there's going to be an incentive to do so. OK, and for women, a lot of the conflict, as I said, happened because of this. Uh, you know, I know it can be a chore sometime and maybe it's because your husband is not indulging you, but it could be a chore. But, you know, sometimes you just have to fulfill your responsibility. It's a chore sometimes to wake up in the morning and get the children ready for school. But then eventually you do it and you get into it. Right. It's, it's, it's a chore sometimes to take your children to school every day. But you have to do it. You might feel in the morning, hey, I don't feel like doing this today, but you're going to have to do it. Right. So whatever it is, I mean, if you don't feel like going to work. Right, because you just feel tired, but then you just have to go to work. And when you get there, it feels okay. Right. So th- there's a number of things here that need to be sorted out. Okay, in brief. And uh, uh, conflicts happen because of pornography, right? The husbands are into pornography. That's a major ab- uh, abomination. Uh, that's something that probably has to be dealt with separately, right? I think uh, therapy, there's therapies for that. And the wife, I'm going to say that the wife has. You have to learn, uh, um, uh, just, just quickly on this, if your husband is into porn, you're the best person that can help him. The first uh, reaction uh, for a person to find out their husband's into porn will be of absolute revulsion, right? That's one. Like, what is he doing? How can he do that? And number two, they're going to feel that they themselves have a shortcoming. That's why the husband is into that. So they're going to feel, aren't I good enough? Well, let me tell you, you may be good enough. But this is not related to that, right? This is not related to that. So first, understand that pornography doesn't have to be, it could be in some cases, but most of the time, I think it doesn't have to be to do with your shortcoming. That's just a separate addiction. He may love you to bits. He may feel you're perfect, whatever, but he just has this addiction. And you're the... you're Now, why it is a revolting act to do so, but... What you need to do is you need to try to become the counselor, right? So you say, look, I understand you've got a problem. I need to help you through it, 
Okay, and once that comes out into the open, it's easier for the husband to deal with it with the wife because he's going to feel a sense of shame, right? And he's going to try to then hide it and so on and so forth. The best is if you can show a compassionate front to this, to to really be empathic about this, and to try to let the husband open up about his addictions. That could help a lot, right? So that's the in brief, and um, of course the husband needs to avoid infidelity. Likewise, the wife needs to uh, avoid infidelity. Casual flirting is really, really harmful to the marriage. Uh, platonic friendships, so-called, with the opposite gender, are not allowed in Islam anyway. All right, uh, you know, but, uh, professionally dealing with somebody that's allowed, you know, to a certain degree, but and you can't have platonic friendships in Islam, you know, with the opposite gender. It's, there's just no such concept of that, right? Professional, be professional, purposeful, polite, and public about your. Uh, stuff, especially at work and so on. You know, there's the Me Too movement. There's uh, the, 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 there's uh, a lot of issues out there with this kind of stuff. And and unlawful relationships, they have to be nipped in the bud from the beginning. If they're allowed to prosper and to carry on, then it's a major problem. So I think uh, in a nutshell, uh, that were a lot of the issues there. So let us stop here and take your questions now, inshallah. Zakunallah khair for the very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, mashallah, a lot of these points are very hard hitting fact as well. And I found throughout the presentation, Mashallah, when you just raised the acknowledgement of uh, common things that happen in our families, it also acts as a type of consolation as well. So Zakunallah khair, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you to benefit the wider ummah throughout your uh, lengthy period of time, Inshallah. So Jazakumullah um, and we'll now open the uh, Q&A for any questions and uh, Mufti will select the questions and he will inshallah uh, answer those now. Okay, right. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So the first question is that what if the husband has cheated on you for 20 years? Are you allowed to divorce him, especially if it's affecting wife's mental reading? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that is a grounds, zina, etc. It could be a grounds for to uh, basically get a a divorce to request a divorce so yeah i mean if that's the question yes you have do have grounds to do that we are scottish frugality is our religion de facto how can we overcome our dna improve spending techniques um when you say you're scottish are you actually scottish like one of the descendants of uh, scott the bruce or something like that or are you do you just live in uh, Glasgow Pollock Shields, uh, respond in the comments, uh, not uh, respond in the chat section, right? Not in the question section. So let me ask you that question first. Okay. Don't ask questions in the chat. We're not going to answer questions. That's just for comments, right? You're pure Scottish. You're a convert then, right? Okay. So what I'm going to have to do, mashallah, Allah bless you, right? So what we're going to have to do then is I'm going to have to go and read up on this. You're going to have to send me some information about this DNA, right, about this particular um, uh, gene, and then I can try to. So when you say you're very frugal, I mean, it, um, do you mean that you don't like to spend enough on, uh, on uh, you know, it's difficult for you guys to spend? Is that what it is? Okay. Well, just understand it's a sadaqa. It's not just you. Why you guys might have it in your day? There's a lot of other people who are stingy, as I mentioned. And I think you just have to understand that it's a sadaqa to spend sufficiently on your, on, your, on your family, right? You get rewarded for doing so. Have the akhira. So for, your, your religion has to overcome your DNA, right? And uh, I'm sure Scottish people make very, very good Muslims, okay? So uh, subhanAllah. Um, the wife is part of the rights, absolutely. She is your responsibility. In fact, the wife has more rights sometimes than, than other people, right? Uh, you, you know, for example, even when, you, when your wife gets, uh, even when you grow up, okay? Um, so uh, Wi-Fi is part of the rights. If it's essential, yes, it's part of the rights. As Wi-Fi is part of the rights, if it's essential as a communication tool, I don't think anybody can, uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody can not have internet in the house nowadays it's it's just well i would love that uh, to to not have internet but i think that's very different that's how we communicate that's how we uh, uh study things that's how we research things that's how we get information right so you're gonna have to have that i mean that's the very difficult but you know if you've got a particular circumstance you have to ask in private as to your particular circumstances but that's just the general answer 
Okay. If my mother is not very fair with her daughter-in-law and treats her differently, I stand up for her. But doing this, my mom thinks I don't respect her and take inside. You're just going to have to learn the best way to do it in a more subtle fashion. You don't have to like stand, stand up blatantly for it. You're just going to have to internalize many things instead. You're just going to have to uh, try to show some praise for one another as well and say, you know, say good things about them as well. Um, the, the other thing is otherwise you'll just, I mean, if you're living together, that just makes it worse, right? So you might have to just live separately to try to keep the calm and to make it better. But at the end of the day, it's just learning tact. I think I explained that earlier anyway, right? I have a couple who have three children. I have a couple who have three children and the wife can't trust the husband as he cheated on her four or six years ago. How are you possible to her again? She needs some kind of counseling for that. There's a lot of people. There's a there's a group. There's a, a family, a, a, a husband and wife that called me from America, from New York. They said we want to come to see you. I was like, okay, you can come to see me, but what's the purpose of the trip? Are you going to come all the way from New York to London? I said, Subhanallah, you know, you're going to come all the way from New York to London. So what is it going to be? All right. So then they told me that she told me that her husband cheated on her 20 years ago, and she can't still forgive him. It just comes up. It's a psychological issue. A lot of women go, the trust issue when it's broken, right? It's very difficult to bring back. So what I would say is that there's a lot of counseling available for that, right? It's kind of a trauma that you have to deal with. There's a lot of coming. You have to realize that people can change, okay? And you have to realize that if you've done a sin, and, uh, you know, because we must have sinned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, somewhat or the other. If we're going to not be able to forgive our spouse, then what about Allah? What about if he says, I'm not going to forgive you because you didn't forgive? I think we have to overcome it. We have to overcome it. Of course, the other spouse needs to try to make an effort to become more trustworthy and show himself as more trustworthy and so on and go to extremes to, to, to show that. But you have to forgive. You can't keep hold of the past. If you keep hold of the past, you will struggle. For example, I've got this bottle of water, right? Now I can hold it here for a few minutes. No problem, right? If I'm going to keep holding on to this for an hour or two, my, my, it's going to become much heavier than it is right now. Right. And if I try to hold on it for five hours or six hours, I'm just struggling. OK, and I'm going to drop it. So drop your thing. Don't hold on to things for no reason. OK, think positively. And there's therapy that you can get for this as well, inshallah. The husband understands his sin and says no matter what he does, his wife doesn't trust him. He says, come in. She needs therapy. Then She needs therapy. Uh, no, I, I mean, uh, uh, he says he said he committed this initially because his wife didn't satisfy him. That's not justified. That's not justified for him to have committed sin because she didn't satisfy him. He needed to sort it out. And if she could not just completely satisfy him, then he could have just married again, right? He could have gotten uh, married, neither divorced and married again, or just have another wife. I mean, you can't you can't commit zina. That's just not allowed anyway. I think uh, next question. I think um, intimacy. Uh, I think intimacy starts during the day. The husband should throughout the day emotionally connect with the wife, giving her cuddles, compliments, and being connected to the wife so she feels connected with you. That, that's a strategy. I mean, everybody does it differently, right? That might be, you know, the way you uh, like to do so. That's a good idea. And, you know, people can benefit from that. Uh, but it's not necessary. You know, that's not necessary. It's just everybody has a different way to do so. You have to learn what pleases the other partner and you start from there. You don't start from what just pleases you. That's very selfish. That's very selfish. All right. So, yeah. Um, so I've noticed that a number of questions are regarding intimacy. Um, so we, the next session with Mufti Muhammad in Adam Kothari is on intimacy. Um, so inshallah, we can probably address quite a few of them next okay, week. Okay, yeah. So, I'm, uh, so you guys can uh, leave those questions for next time, okay? Um, Salam, please can I have some advice If a wife says to her husband Before they got married I will live with my family However many problems we'll have to move, We will have to move out After many issues Husband is saying No, I can't move out I can't leave my mum She's my mum She comes three times I can't leave her Blah, blah, blah uh, He says that as well Now the marriage has lots of problems Isn't the marriage based on a line Absolutely it is Yes, I confirm it is Yeah If that's your question Then yes, that's definitely uh, deceptive uh, it's uh, going against the promise uh, and forget all of that 
uh, he is required to give you separate accommodation. It could be a separate flat in the same house, as long as they don't intrude into that. They can't intrude into that. That That's what the requirement is, okay? But you have a right to demand to be elsewhere or have a divorce if you want, right? That That's basically what the case is. I feel like I'm walking on eggshells with my wife. She gets extremely angry, aggressive, and harsh, blunt with her words. Our marriage is very unstable. How can this be managed? I think she needs, uh, I think you guys need counseling. She needs counseling. And again, um, uh, yeah, she needs counseling, all right? She needs counseling. Uh, you're going to have to uh, try to speak to her nicely to see what the issue is. If she can calm down, you can maybe get her sister or her mother or her father or somebody else to speak to her. If none of that works, you can just force her to go to some kind of counseling, right? Otherwise, uh, you know, you're not going to get far with this. Sorry, key point that I forgot to add was that two years after the husband cheated, he was caught once again by his wife talking on video call with the same girl. The wife at this point was absolutely distraught. Things were good between them and everywhere and felt very hurt about the fact that I was still getting in touch with the girls, right? Also, after he was caught, he spent two hours on the phone consoling the other girl rather than his wife. Is this... It is this that has stuck with her and is causing her... Again, it's the same answer. It's the same answer. Okay, he was in it at that time, but then he's weaned off her now, right? Meaning of this other person, so hopefully it should be better. And again, uh, the husband has to make an absolute effort to try to show that that's the case, that he is offered. It doesn't matter how bad the sin was, how bad the issue was. You know, people can rectify themselves. People can reform themselves. and But he has to demonstrate that. And the wife has to be forgiving. La ilaha illallah. What if the husband is not fulfilling his obligations, does not share a bed, is resentful towards you, refused to get counseling, has relied on the woman to take financial responsibility and is emotionally abusive when you express the failure, does not spend time on you and then expects you to have a physical relationship uh, with you, does not buy you gifts, is better, is bit bitter, how enough do you have a relationship physically, your heart is broken, absolutely. You guys need some serious counseling, right? This couple needs serious counseling because... You know the the, the 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 relationship can't just be made, it can't just be based for the husband that he has to just get sexual fulfillment from it. That's what he's using her for. She's not a sex doll, right? That's not the purpose of this. They're, you're a human being, right? And people have to be dealt with as human beings, right? So of course you've just you've just made everything his problem, and you know you actually have no problems at all, right? So uh, you guys will you, you guys should either if you can't discuss it together then bring somebody else to discuss it with or go to counseling. Otherwise, this isn't going to get any better, right? How best to uh, protect uh, your marriage from nazar or from anything bad affecting it? Uh, you, yeah, there's a number of du'as. Uh, the, you read uh, Ayatul Kursi and you read every morning and evening as well. Number three, you read the du'as. Bismillah, Right? And so on. So there's a number of du'as for that. You do a ruqya, right? That should, inshallah, keep you protected. So I'm having to answer a bit quickly because we got a lot of questions and I don't, uh, you know, we don't have too much time. Regarding intimacy, do you just fulfill your desire seeing it as a chore? I think I'll leave that for next week, right? Um, can a wife ask for a separate accommodation or is it better if she, is better if she compromises, obviously? Right, because it's just easier financially, less problematic, and whatever. But if it's causing her, you know, stress in a way that she can't handle it, then yes, she has a right to that. That is her right. As I said, it could even be one room, a toilet, and a kitchen in, a, or a studio flat within a larger house, as long as they don't have the right to come in there and it's a, got they got a lock and key. That's fine as well. Allah, Allah, Allah. If a husband is emotionally and physically unavailable and in spite of wife's needs, he disregards her. Wife has tried external intervention, but that didn't work either. What about wife's need? Will she be sinful if she used other means to satisfy herself? I mean, if you're using halal means, then no. If you, you, uh, Women are not allowed to masturbate. Men are not allowed to masturbate on their own either. So no, I mean, what you need to do is you need to maybe... If you're saying that there's absolutely no way forward and that is important, then you can ask for a divorce and then find somebody else to marry. Really, there's, you can't do it haram just to maintain a marriage. You can't commit haram to maintain a marriage. 
I'm separated from my husband at the moment. However, I was thinking about getting back together. However, she, he wants me to go back to in-laws and live with them, uh, with with my son and five other people in the house. And I don't want to go into them because we lived in our own flat for four years. What advice would you give? If you cannot, I mean, try to make it work. It'll be easier. But if you cannot make it work, then you just have to insist that you're in a separate place. But remember, you are gambling your marriage on this. I'm not sure to go back to him or not. How do I know my istikhara is correct? You're asking a seriously loaded question, right? There's not enough information here for somebody to give you very particular advice so that we can just give you general advice to that, right? So you should contact a scholar, right, um, in, in private and ask them this question for your own particular circumstance, right? My in-laws tell my husband that I have not submitted to him yet and they say I'm too attached to family and I need to cut ties with them and make my husband everything to me. How to address this without causing problems with the in-laws? Well, maybe you are. I mean, I don't know, right? Maybe you are too attached to your family. Maybe you're constantly for several hours of the day, you're either trying to go there or you're speaking to them or whatever the case, too much. You do have to realize that you have to try to demonstrate that you are part of this family now. You have to make huge sacrifices. Huge sacrifices for this, all right? That doesn't mean you neglect your family completely, but if you expect that you need to speak to them for, you know, some hours each day or whatever, all right? That That's not right, right? Maybe you are. So I can't answer this question, right? Unless I know more details to this, because I'm going to have to see whether you are, because there's no point trying to attack him without understanding you or attack them. But the main thing is that if you are not like that, then I guess um, you'll have to find out what exactly they want you to do to submit as such, right? And la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, right? Uh, to sub, uh, you know, to, to you know, what does that mean? You know, try to understand and then and then uh, consider those things and see if they're unreasonable or what they are, right? But if you don't know what those things are, then you're both going to be jumping around without really, right, and understanding what the issue is. Okay. Uh, if the wife found out the husband is having an inclination to same sex, can you advise for both? Well, he needs uh, he needs some kind of serious therapy there, right? Uh, to try to understand what's going on there. Is it a passing phase? Is he really like that? What's going on? I've dealt with cases, at least two or three cases, where the husband turned out to you know be a very strong homosexual tendencies and just wasn't interested in women. And all of those had to end in divorce. There was no way that they wanted to carry on with those uh, relationships. Okay, so. Um, that, that, that's a tough one. It's a difficult one. They need counseling. Any advice on how someone can deal with anger issues and taking uh, talking with partner? Um, I've mentioned a number of things. You can get anger therapy, right? For me, what I benefited from was reading the Hadith and the Quranic verses, okay? Um, about anger and to calm yourself down and think of the harms of anger. If you actually read up online about anger and how it's stressful and how it's bad for your health and so on and so forth, you'll, inshallah, will, it'll make it easy for you as well, right? There's a lot of anger management courses that you can take. I don't know any to suggest to you, but, you know, you can uh, definitely, uh, fi- uh, you know, take an anger management course and that would be very helpful because anger is one of the big problems of marriage, right? How could solve the conflict regarding wife wanting to move out from the in-laws and husband doesn't? As this was not an issue until wife met the mother-in-law. Uh, she has a right. Even if she agreed to stay with the mother-in-law and then after that it turned out to be bad, okay, uh, and she couldn't handle it, she's got a right. In the Islamic tradition, according to the Hanafi school, right, the wife has to be given a separate accommodation. As I said, it can be part of the main occupant, but totally separate and independent. Right, even if it's part of the same building, but she, that's her requirement. That's part of the nafaqa. That's part of the expenses for having a wife. If you can't maintain a wife, then don't, don't, don't you know, don't get a wife. You have to give her. Uh, she has a right to demand that, even if she promised before to stay with the, you know, uh, it, because things can change. Great, like you mentioned credit cards in relation to that. I knew somebody was going to come uh, ask that. Um, I'm going to miss that question because uh, uh, we don't have time. Is it allowed to talk with the fiancé over the phone? Only for formal reasons, only to, you know, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, you can't have a casual chat, let's put it that way. You're not allowed to have an informal, uh, and uh, they're very harmful actually, right? Because you get to uh, understand uh, the, the, uh, the issues too quickly and then, 
sorry, that, that, I think that was all, that, that actually this question was to do with one of the first sessions. So I think I'm going to miss that question. How do you remove the feeling of guilt if you want to move with your husband and leave his mother alone due to conflict between daughter-in-law and mother-in-law? I think uh, the best thing to do would be to maybe ask a few other people about your situation and see what they think about it and be reasonable about it. Like, can I really stay or not? If you can stay, then you should stay because it's easier, right? But if you cannot stay and it's really over the top and you're stressed and whatever, and you know, there's no way for you to manage it, it's really bad. Like others would agree with you that it's really bad. Then you don't, shouldn't feel any guilt about it because it's your right, right? And you need to live a life. If your spouse has certain mental health issues, which has sudden anger outbursts towards a spouse and doesn't see and get help, how do you deal with this? Well, he needs help. You can't deal with it. You're going to have to have patience, right? You just have to have a lot of patience, understand his sickness, understand his illness, and just try to find a way of dealing with it when it's in that bout, as long as it's not permanent, right? Uh, he should get help as well. How can we learn about our new ways to spice our marriage? My husband is one of the best things that's ever happened to me, but the sex side of things, he lacks knowledge on romance and foreplay. Um, uh, get, get, get the books on uh, sexual ethic of Mufti Muhammad is going to be giving you a talk next week. Get his book. Uh, it's a red book. You can get it from White Thread Press as well. There's a section in my book as well on the subject. I think there's another book out there by a Muslim about uh, sexual relationships and so on and so forth, right? Unfortunately, there's not enough out there. There are some books in Arabic, but there's not enough out there about this. So it's just about learning how to do that. Give him new ideas or whatever the case is, and uh, hopefully that can help. I have been in a sex and marriage uh, for five years. Husband has erectile dysfunction and refused to go to therapy. Medical treatment haven't worked. I'm 38, desperate for children. How can I proceed? Any good sex counsel? Unfortunately, I don't know of any counselors, unfortunately, who do that, but I'm sure there must be somebody out there. Can men, boys, be taught learning halal way on a course in Darlum, how to flirt with a wife, give compliments to swoon her? Father than acting like a beast during the day, angry, short-tempered, and then Niman. He probably comes from such a family or something like that. I mean, where do people learn about this from? Okay. Yeah, the book is out of stock everywhere right now. It's uh, but it should be, I think, in the next week or two, the 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 new stock should come everywhere. But pretty much everybody's out of it right now. It's in print, it's re being reprinted right now. Right. Uh, rather than acting like a beast during the day, short-tempered and then demand the rights at night and help them train with them with arbitration. Yes, that's a good idea. There should definitely be more courses on that subject. Right. How can we get a counseling session with you? I don't do counseling, unfortunately. My apologies. It just takes too long. I'm available on my phone for any reasonable time in the day for you to call and ask your own question and for me to discuss with you. I just can't sit with two people together because that just takes too long and I just don't have the time, unfortunately, all right, for that. Uh, but inshallah, there's other good people. What type of privacy should there be between husband and wife? For example, a wife might want to go through her husband's phone and vice versa. How do we balance this? That's not allowed. You don't go through one another's phone. That's just not allowed. How do you balance this? As some may feel that we are breaking trust when one refuses to do so in order to maintain privacy. SubhanAllah. I mean... My wife probably knows my password, but she doesn't go through my phone. It's very harmful to do this, all right? So, um, yeah. The webinar on Zamzam Academy about how to please the wife is excellent. Much understand. Okay, so I forgot that there was one on there. You can check that out. I don't know if somebody's got a link. But yeah, I, I couldn't remember. I've done so many of these courses that I can't remember what we've got and what we don't. So it's good. Thanks for bringing that up. What's the best way to have healthy and good kids that will grow up as good Muslims? Obviously, normal du'as. I mean, look, I'm going to try to uh, you see where we're over time. I'm going to give another four minutes or something as I've got to go to another meeting. So I'm going to just try to deal with a few questions and uh, those I can't do with, I apologize. Um, bringing up children, I think you should uh, listen to the, uh, was that on Misbah that we did about bringing up teenagers or something? And is there a link for it that you can post? There you go. No, uh, they, they should post the link soon. How do you get over the hatred you have for your mother-in-law because she treats you badly and passes nasty comments like Mufti mentioned because they get treated badly, they feel they're I don't know, that's a tough one. That's a personal thing. You have to have love for Allah and love for Allah's creatures and expand your tawakkul. 
it's a difficult one. It's not easy. I completely understand. That's not very easy how to gain love again. But I think if you try to just understand that she may be uh, totally helpless in her behavior, and sometimes giving gifts might bring about good behavior. You know, I know it, it sounds bad, but try to give gifts to her and see if that makes a change. And that will help to open up, you know, the whole pursuit of buying the right gift. That sometimes helps a lot, right? And make a lot of dua, inshallah, that should help. Uh, ask Allah to remove the hatred, only he can do that. My husband has severe OCD and he's washing his hands, constantly wiping down his clothes, door from the alfine, and how can I overcome it? You can't overcome this, he has to overcome it. There's no answer, right? He has to overcome it. He needs to get help for OCD. It's a medical condition, he needs to get help for OCD. He can't just ask a scholar whether this is pure or impure. He has to get help for OCD, all right? How do you deal with a husband who thinks being overly friendly, flesh with work colleagues is justified to get things done at work? That's just a silly idea. It's haram. What he's doing is haram, right? You have to tell him it's wrong and you have to uh, get him to write a question to a scholar or consult a scholar about this you know, for him to hear it directly unless he's listening right now. What if a husband lives in past lives, refuses to change and then expects physical contact? I think we've answered these questions already. Right. Uh, may Allah reward for helping married couples. Really grateful to have a platform so we can refer to him. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah. I mean, to your du'as. Uh, can you provide us a context for good Muslim counseling arbitrators? Unfortunately, I don't know. Um, there's a, there's a few, there's a good few out there. I had a list somewhere. Um, I don't know if uh, the, the Misbah team have a suggestion. Right. Our kids are growing up as parents. What are the duties? Uh, I think we dealt with that already. Mother and father-in-law don't accept the daughter-in-law, not calling the mum and not calling them mum and dad. The marriage is breaking as mother-in-law thinks son is under black magic. Sorry, that's just too vague. Allah help you. I'll, I'll pray for you. Allah help you. Uh, Afshan Khan is good, yes. Afshan Khan is definitely good. Yeah, she's got a good book as well, and she's quite good. Okay, I think I'm going to have to stop here. Uh, the questions are endless. Uh, I apologize that we can't, I mean, we, we can never deal with all the questions because there's just always so many questions. I mean, that's why one of my suggestions was that we just do a question and answer session, but even then we probably have too many question sessions. I mean, we've got, you know, 250, 300 people listening to this. So there's going to be that many questions. You just can't answer that many questions. So my apologies for that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray that Allah make it easy. And I'm going to suggest that, look, uh, I think from what we discussed today, all right, I think you, even though I may have not answered your question directly, I think by answering other people's questions, it may have given you a lot of ideas of where to go with this. There are certain standard procedures that look, in terms of issues, if you cannot resolve it yourself, then you get somebody else involved to resolve it and do that sooner than later. Okay, don't do it right from the beginning. First, try to deal with it yourself using different tactics. Speak to them in a kind way. Set up the dinner table and then speak to them. If that doesn't work, then speak, uh, uh, you know, right to your spouse. Okay, right to your spouse. And because sometimes, you know, they're just too angry to listen to you straight away. So if you write a long letter to them where they can relax and read it and ruminate over it, that's very helpful. If that doesn't work, then get somebody else involved that, you know, uh, will be uh, have confidence and so on and uh, do things confidently, uh, confidentially and, and uh, try that. If that doesn't work, then you need to escalate it. But do it sooner than later, because if it's something that definitely you cannot deal with, then you need to get try to get a result sooner than later. Otherwise, it just gets worse and worse and you get deeper and deeper into the rut. Then it's much more difficult to come out. OK, just remember that. Um, uh, let, let, me, let me just share this screen and show you one more thing um, before we. So, you know, when you uh, uh, so you're having a decent relationship, right? So that's a decent relationship. Uh, well, it goes up and down, right? It goes up and down. It gets very good. It goes up and down. Right. That's what happens. Now, what happens is that if you jump in a rut and it's just a small rut, but then it's lasting forever, three, four days, you're carrying on like that. Now, can you see that's going to get stronger and stronger? Right, meaning it's going to get worse and worse. Now, if you're getting into a deep rut for a very long time, then to sort this out, it's how do you how do you fill all of this up? How do you fill all of this up after 
a year, two years, three years, four years, it's very difficult to get back up. So try not to get that deep. When you have an issue, try to resolve it and then come back up. Okay, come back up. You have an issue, push it back up. Find ways to push it back up and then carry on. You know, there's always going to be ups and downs, but never get down into the complete canyon so that you can't come out again. Right? That That's very, very, very important. Okay. Um, yeah, my number is on the Zamzam Academy website. It's there. Just don't call at any weird time. Uh, call at decent times and inshallah, I'll speak to you. Okay, I think that's it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May Allah give us good lives, uh, allow us to deal with the conflicts, understand, uh, allow us to understand personality traits, understand our own traits, our own selves, and make our own selves better and recognize that people have defects. Okay, and let's learn to uh, live with the defect. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resolve our situations. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yun wa ja'alna lil muttaqeena imama. Okay, I will say that don't email me. I, 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 I can't deal with emails right now. Uh, just too busy. If you want, you just pick up the phone and call. Otherwise, uh, you know, there's a lot of other people that you may be able to email. Okay.